Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to a conversation with Congressman Jim McGovern. He has taken time out of his busy schedule to be here. I'd also like to share our select board member, Tim Hilchey, and our Connected Community Initiative Chair, Denise Mason, are also here today. Congressman, we appreciate having you here. You do so much important work in Washington, especially over the last couple of years. So thank you for taking time out to meet with these seniors from the South County Senior Center. We represent communities of Deerfield, Sunderland, and Waitley. Um, and I'm not sure if you'd like to do a question answer yeah, or... That's, that's better. So folks, if you have questions, if you'd raise your hand, We'll go around. We don't have the microphone system here. I'll repeat the questions so if you, uh, so everybody can hear them. But uh, but I look, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you for welcoming me here today on this beautiful day. It's a little hot out, uh, but uh, but look, I, I just came back from Washington uh, 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 on Saturday, and I'm you know I'm here. For, we're on our district work period. And uh, we'll be called back into session probably in the next week or two uh, to, uh, to pass this big reconciliation bill that, among other things, will, will, will include um, a, a provision to allow Medicare to negotiate for lower prescription drug costs for everybody. So we get that done. That's a big deal that will help a lot of senior citizens, uh, not only here in Deerfield, but all across Massachusetts and all across the country. But in any event, rather than me just kind of talk, um, I'd, I'd be more interested in responding to your questions and comments or advice or well, you know, whatever's on your mind. How long has the Deerfield River project been going on? The Deerfield River, how long has the Deerfield uh, River project been going? So we've been, uh, it just, it's really kind of just beginning um, in many respects. We, we, we want to designate it as a wild and scenic area and uh, I was just in Deerfield. When, when was it? Just last week? With, uh, yeah. yeah you, and um, time flies, right? On the um, and uh, on the bridge. On the bridge. Yeah. Um, and, and somebody told me you could, even though you're not supposed to, that if I could jump off the bridge, that it's deep yeah. enough for me to. Uh, yeah, dive yeah. Right. So, uh, but the but the deal is, uh, you know, there has to be a study, and then there'll be a recommendation, which I assume will be positive, and then it will be designated. And so it could take a little, you know, a little while. It doesn't happen overnight. But the v importance of that is that uh, Deerfield and, uh, will be eligible for a lot of federal grants uh, to help not only with the conservation uh, of the river, but also uh, to help with recreation as well. I mean, it might be a walking path to the river. It might be a boat a ramp, or it could be a, a place for people to go fishing, which you know, I, I'm, I understand is a very popular place for people to, to fish. So, uh, and by doing that, it not only preserves this incredible treasure, but it's also good for the community. It makes, it, 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 more people want to come to Deerfield. And when they come to Deerfield, not only to enjoy the river, they might want to, you know, explore historic Deerfield, or they might want to eat at a local restaurant. Um, or, you know, so there's, there's an economic benefit to this. Uh, in a way that is complementary of the town. But uh, the legislation has been introduced and I'm looking forward to trying to get it enacted uh, this year. So that was introduced in Washington? Did yeah, it was introduced. So I, when I was here, I think it was on a Monday, I introduced it the next day, on a Tuesday, so last Tuesday. So is it possible to bill in the Massachusetts it, legislature? No, so this is a federal bill. So yeah, all, we, all we need is the, yeah, this is a federal designation. And then, and then you're eligible for a lot, some federal resources. And that's really good for what yeah. And by the way, working with your local officials here, you know, I was briefed on some of their plans, um, I think for a whole bunch of stuff, including the new, a new senior center, right? It was, and uh, we were talking about uh, possible federal assistance to help with, with that. And, um, and, you know, I think we, we have a plan in place where we're gonna be meeting on a regular basis to find out, is there any state money available? Is there any federal money available? And how do we help implement this vision that they have outlined? So it's all very, very, you know, I'm really, I'm really excited about the future uh, of this community. 
you know, Hillary Clinton says uh, it takes a village. It really does. But I say it takes a plan. Um, and if you don't have a plan, then the village doesn't know what to do. Uh, and so uh, your local officials here have done a really good job of putting together a, a really good plan uh, that I think will make it easier to get federal resources to help support the implementation of that plan. Okay, yes. My name's John. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, inflation. All right. Inflation, when this first came out, it came out right after uh, President Biden became the president. It started creeping up. They got to a certain point, then we had the war, Putin's war. So the first thing Biden did was he started to complain about Putin's war causing inflation, which is not true. It caused a little bit of it, but not a lot of it. I have a problem with the president, the way he's operating, because it seems like he won't admit anything. Inflation is transitory. Oh, it's going away. Don't worry about it. They finally took one of the uh, heads of his department to finally say, yeah, we do have inflation. But I think to this day, he still has not admitted that we have inflation. And I'd like to know what the legislature is going to do about the inflation. Mm -hmm. Because my understanding is, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I understand you have to get your interest rate up higher than the inflation rate which is currently at 7 or 8% now, mm -hmm. which means we're talking 10% for loans. I think there's something wrong. And you know something? Everybody in this room has to live within our means. Mm -hmm. We live within our means. I'd love to see the federal government try and do that for a change mm -hmm. because they're really not doing it. As far as I'm concerned, most politicians we send to Washington have one goal, play Santa Claus to the world. Mm -hmm. We don't need Santa Clauses. We don't have 400 Santa Clauses down at the legislature. We need somebody to look out for us and start taking care of the United States. Okay. Did everybody hear that? Yeah, I don't, I don't, you have a good booming voice, so I don't think I have to repeat the question to everybody. That's part of my military. Yeah. You learn yeah. Well, well, first of all, let, let, let me just say, yeah, we are dealing with inflation. All right? So. I don't know if anybody, anybody's denying that inflation is real. I think where I would disagree with you is somehow that, that President Biden caused inflation. Because, it, it's, because if you believe that, then the only place where there's an inflation problem is in the United States. We have a global problem with inflation. Um, and uh, a lot of that really is as a result of the pandemic that we had just gone through. I right, say so during the pandemic, um, you know, we, we didn't demand as much. We didn't travel as much. Um, we didn't require as much to be produced. Uh, people kind of stayed, you know, home. Um, and in any event, the, the, uh, the demand, uh, the supply and demand was very different um, during the pandemic than it was post-pandemic. So we come, we're coming out of the pandemic, the demand is growing. Now we've realized a couple of things. Uh, that, uh, you know, over the years, and by the way, decades and decades I'm talking about, we started to outsource everything. You know, we, we started to outsource more to China. We started to outsource more, you know, to other countries around the world. So we weren't producing as much here. And so all of a sudden, when the demand came back for some of these goods and services, we, all, we realized, well, we don't really have control over that. And so we, we, were, we were importing, we, we closed factories here in the United States, and we outsourced them to places like China. And so we, we didn't have control over increasing the supply like, like, we, like a lot of people thought we did. So one of the things we have just done, um, and let me get, it sounds a little technical, but believe it or not, in almost everything we buy, there are these semiconductor chips that are required, right? Whether you buy an automobile or, uh, uh, you know, or one of these or in um, your laptops or you name it, I mean, TVs and everything, you know, it, to manufacture these, it require these little chips. China was making all of them. China was making all of them. Uh, and so one of the things we just passed in Congress was a major bill to reinvest in the chips industry and to um, reignite an effort to start uh, manufacturing those chips here in the United States. 
We just passed the bill. Unfortunately, it, it, well, it passed with a, a decent bipartisan vote in the Senate, but then for whatever reason, Republicans decided to walk away from it in the House. We didn't have very many people who supported it. I guess they must like China more than they like us, but whatever. We passed it. It's going to be signed into law. 100,000 new jobs, and it's going to be a major boon to this industry, which is one of the ways to com combat inflation. Um, on gas prices, which is something that we all are dealing with. I mean, the President of the United States, again, same thing, was a supply and demand. We weren't, re we, we, we weren't producing as much uh, uh, gas and oil uh, during the uh, pandemic as we needed to do in the aftermath. One would have thought that the oil industry, once the pandemic was over, would produce at least as much as they were before the pandemic. They chose not to. Why? Because they find out they can make more money by producing less and charging you more. And that's what they've done. Um, and quite frankly, I, I think the president needs to be tougher on the oil companies because I think they're a, a price gouging. Uh, those who defend the oil companies, I, I'm just stunned by that. But there are some who do say, oh, they, it's free enterprise. They can make whatever they, they want. I mean, they're gouging people. And we have laws in states against price gouging during uh, emerges, national emergencies. We ought, to, we ought to enforce laws against companies like big oil that are gouging people in the aftermath, in, in, you know, in the aftermath of, uh, of, of the pandemic. But the president's been releasing um, millions of gallons of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, um, and gas prices are going down. By four, uh, they've gone down 40, percent, 40 cents uh, in the last, I think, couple of months. It's not where they need to be. They need to be much lower, but at least it's, they're trending in a direction that we want them to trend, going down lower and lower and lower. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're going to have to make sure that there is uh, adequate uh, resources available to help people who are struggling be able to heat their homes in the winter um, in case they're not, oil is not down enough for people to get by. Um, we we, we want to pass this, uh, uh, this new bill that you heard that probably Joe Manchin has come on board with, in addition to lowering the cost of prescription drugs, which I think, again, the pharmaceutical industry is ripping people off too, but this will help Medicare negotiate lower prices for senior citizens, similar to the way the VA does. You know, when veterans go get their prescriptions at the VA, they get a, a discounted price, not because the pharmaceutical companies are, are giving them a lower price out of respect for their service, it's because the VA can negotiate with the drug companies on behalf of all of the veterans in this country. And we ought to give Medicare that ability too, because we could, get, we could drive those prices down. And that would be helpful, especially during this time of inflation, uh, that, uh, to, to pay less and less for your prescription drugs. But in addition, in that bill, um, by closing some major tax loopholes for multi-billionaires or big corporations, um, there will be a huge amount of money that we can put toward paying down, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the deficit, lowering the deficit and paying down the debt. And that will help uh, control inflation as well. Um, and so there are some things that are going on that I think I've got I gotta, I gotta to pay off. And let me just say one final thing. Um, we're not the Santa Claus of the world. Um, you know, th this notion that somehow 10% or 20% or 30% of our federal budget is going to other countries around the world. Our foreign aid program is like about a 1% of our federal budget. Um, now we could cut all of that off. Uh, it, it's not gonna solve all the problems that we're, we're talking about. But look, I mean, we, we, we have an interest in our national security and in global security and stability because when there are wars, you know, all kinds of, it impacts everybody. And we're seeing what's happening with, with Ukraine. There's no doubt that Putin's war against Ukraine, which was unprovoked, is having an impact on the, on the price of energy. I mean, just no, there's no doubt about it. Um, it's also having an impact on the price of food. Ukraine is like the breadbasket of the world. And finally, we're seeing some grain and corn being able to get out of Ukraine. But basically, they, they supply the, all the food much of the food for the Middle East and for Africa, not just 
emergency food, not just humanitarian food, but that's where they buy their food from, that goes into their, into their markets. And so if that food can't get there, then there's less food you know, to, to, to get to everybody, and you see the prices go up. So look, I mean, this is, the, this is a challenging time, but here's the deal. When people say it's like, uh, it's just one person, you know, or one party, you know what? It's just not accurate. And I think we have to get to the point where we start putting people ahead of politics. You know, I mean, you should support bills because they're good. You should oppose bills because they're bad. I mean, let me give you an example. Right now, you know, I don't know how many of you are following the debate on, on this bill to help uh, veterans who have been um, impacted by burn pits, right? I mean, it goes back to, to, to Vietnam. I mean, we go, we go back, to Vietnam War veterans, veterans up to current, current veterans. And these are people getting cancer because of what they were exposed to chemicals that were being burnt within an area where they could breathe in all, all, this, all this poisonous stuff. And people d develop cancer, and it's, it's, it's horrific. And we passed a bill in the Senate and in the House to be able to make sure they have guaranteed care, right? It had to go back to the Senate for one final approval because there was a an error in the bill, but we fixed it in the House, went back to the Senate, passed the Senate overwhelmingly, first time, passed the House overwhelmingly, and now it's being stalled in the Senate. And the same people that voted for it are saying they're not going to vote for it right now because they don't like the fact that Biden struck a deal with Joe Manchin on investing and fighting the climate crisis and combating the climate crisis. I mean, are you for real? I mean, you may not like, you, if you want to deny that there's a climate crisis going on, that's fine, whatever. Then vote against the bill. But to hold these veterans hostage because you're just mad, you know, that another piece of legislation moving forward is cruel. It's cruel. That's, that's when you put politics ahead of people. It ought to be the other way around. You got to put people ahead of politics. So let's help our veterans. And, you know, if you want to combat climate change, you know, I think we should. I mean, if, I think that we have a crisis, then you vote for it. But if you don't want to do that, you vote no on that bill. But don't hold veterans hostage because, you know, you want to make a political point. And that's the problem, right? I mean, you know, one of the things that, you know, that drives me crazy about Washington sometimes is that people, it's, everything's political. I can't vote for you on, on this even though it's right because it might make you look good. Well, no, how about we just do what's right, period? And we have differences of opinion on things and where you disagree, you can vote no, where you agree, you vote yes. But I just, I find what is happening right now with holding this bill hostage in the Senate I, I find it not only maddening, it is cruel. It is cruel. And we have veterans now that are camping out on the Capitol steps, um, you know, round the clock, trying to convince a handful of senators, Republican senators in this case, to move out of the way. I mean, you know, this is about getting people health care and benefits um, who quite frankly deserve that. And I think most, I, think, I, I would bet if you did a poll, like 99.9% .9 of the American people would say, yes, do this. And yet we can't get it done right now. And hopefully that'll change. But. Your assistance on getting leads VA hospital yeah. to stay open, that was amazing. Yeah. So yeah, and I and I and I don't and, and, and my view is we just got to keep at it, right? Um, so on the, the VA hospital here and in uh, uh, in Leeds, um, you know, for a lot of veterans in this area, um, you know, it is. I mean, it's it's it, it 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 has to stay open. Um, we you know we have people uh, who utilize the 
uh, that, that, uh, that facility uh, who come from a lot of the, of, the, of the towns here, where it takes a while to drive from one of these, some of these hill towns to, you know, to the hospital. I mean, if that hospital were gone, you'd be driving to what, Connecticut? Or, or you know, or Boston? I don't know, wait, I don't, you know, we're, we're, I think they're trying to drive people to Connecticut. And we did a, a meeting, a public meeting with a lot of our veterans, some who are dealing with issues of, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome and other things, who have said that if I have to drive to Connecticut, I'm not, I forget about it, I'm not doing it. You know, um, routine checkups. You know, if, if people have to drive long distances, they won't go. And then they may have something that could easily be remedied, but they'll let it go and let it go and let it go because of the long distance until it's something serious. And then sometimes you're in a position where they discover things too late. So this is, this is vital that it that stays open. And, you know, Congress passed this bill um, called the Mission Act. Uh, I voted against it. Uh, there were some good things in the Mission Act, but I was concerned about this move toward cons closing and consolidating VA hospitals and clinics around the country. I wanted to make sure that whatever review we did was in fact, you know, based on, you know, on, uh, you know, on, on accurate information, that it was being done in a way that we could all have confidence um, in how, was, how the review was gonna go. And then they come out with this recommendation uh, that says that they recommend that this hospital be closed. And, and, and one of the reasons they gave was that there needed to be uh, like a couple of hundred million dollars in additional investments to get it up to where it needed to be. Well, okay. But the problem was those investments were already made. So they already did it, right? It is up to where it needs to be. And there were more investments, but the recommendation didn't even acknowledge that we actually address the concerns. And the problem with the whole process was that the, the board would ha that oversees this would either have to recommend to the president, you know, do the whole thing, I mean, implement all the recommendations of the report, or do none of them. So they couldn't like pick and choose. And in any event, you know, we learned that the recommendations were based on faulty information and accurate information. And so we raised holy hell. Um, we got some of the senators, um, Senator Tester from Montana, uh, you know, uh, we get some help from uh, Senator Manchin as well from West Virginia, but Senator Tester, who's on the key committee, uh, Veterans Committee over in the Senate said that he would not uh, uh, allow the Senate to vote on any uh, uh, recommendations to put on this advisory board that would review this. Therefore, you know, they, they could make no recommendation. And, uh, and, um, and I, you know, I, we applauded that, but I, 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 I just, you know, there are people who want to privatize the entire VA system and who want to just get rid of it as we know it. And, um, you know, a lot of, you know, and, and they, are, they are fighting hard to, you know, to try to, you know, move forward these recommendations. So in the National Defense Authorization Bill, I put in language to eliminate this commission that would oversee, uh, you know, make, that over, eliminate this commission that would make recommendations as to whether or not to move forward, um, you know, on closures or consolidations. And then the defense appropriations bill, just in case, I zeroed out all the money. <laughs> so they can't, you know, they have no money to implement uh, any of these recommendations. And we need to make sure the Senate follows suit. But, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a, a fight um, that we just constantly have to be, uh, you know, uh, engaged in because there are people, as I said, who want the VA system to be farmed out just to the, you know, regular hospitals. And, um, you know, I'm not a veteran, but, you know, from a lot of the veterans that I have talked to, uh, the VA provides unique care. Uh, they have people there that understand what veterans have gone through and the unique circumstances um, and who are more understanding of, you know, what their health needs are. If you eliminate that, I think it's a great disservice uh, to our veterans. So, uh, so we are, 
you know, I am, uh, somebody said we're doing overkill uh, in terms of trying to stop all this. Well, you know what? There's no such thing as overkill uh, when it comes to this. And so I think we're, we're in, in, in good shape right now. Um, uh, but that was a close call. And, um, and so, uh, so I, I'm real, you know, again, I, I don't know whether any of you were at the listening session we did with veterans, but uh, all the questions and all the concerns that were raised, I, we transcribed them, I handed them to the VA Secretary, Dennis McDonough, uh, so that he had this. Um, and I, we provided him all the updated information on all the federal investments that had been made in that facility. Uh, so they understand that, you know, what the reality is. So I think we're, I think we're, we're in okay shape right now. Yeah. You should be congratulated for your efforts at the hospital for keeping it open for all our veterans. But I am concerned that it's been going on for years now. And that is the flood of illegal drugs coming over the, the border. Fentanyl is killing over 100,000 of our youth and our middle-aged people from 18 to 45 years old. Nothing is being done about it by this current administration. And it's, it's a personal matter with me. I lost my youngest daughter, who was a first lieutenant in the Army. She was on oxycontin for her 19 disability that she had. Serving 10 years in the military, she couldn't get the oxycontin. She went out on the street, and I'm telling this in front of everybody here. I'm not afraid of what I'm telling you. She could not find the medication that she wanted. She found it on the street and lost her life. Well, first of all, I'm sorry uh, about your daughter, and um, you know, um, you know, uh, and uh, you know. The, we have, a, we have a problem uh, in this country. Uh, and there's two different issues here. I mean, the oxycodone issue um, is a, is a, is a, has been a problem because of the way the drug companies have pushed it and some have over-prescribed it. Um, and, and it, you know, and there are, and so, some of the behavior of some of these drug companies, quite frankly, has been criminal. Um, secondly, I mean, there is this continued problem of illicit drugs, illegal drugs coming into this country. Uh, by the way, not just coming over the border. We know that stuff comes over the border because we apprehend, you know, huge amounts of, uh, of illegal uh, drugs all the time. Um, what gets through, I mean, who knows? But it's coming in this country in a variety of different ways. Uh, and, um, and there needs to be a... Um, you know, a, a, some fresh thinking about how we combat it. I mean, one is, you know, when there's a demand, uh, there's always somebody who wants to supply it. They'll find a way to supply it. Um, and um, and we, 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 gotta, we have to figure out how to, how to reduce the demand. We need to figure out how to make sure that better medical care is available for everybody, um, people who are struggling with, um, you know, with, with, with various challenges, whether it's with addiction or substance use disorder or whatever. Um, we need stronger mental health um, interventions in this country. I mean, I did a, um, I did a forum in Worcester with um, my colleague Jamie Raskin, who you may know from the January 6th uh, 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 special commission, but he lost his son um, who died of suicide um, and, um, and we did a forum on, you know, on, uh, you know, mental health challenges amongst, uh, younger people in this country and the complexity and the enormity of the problem, you know, is, uh, you know, was made very, very clear to us and the inadequacy of our response, uh, the lack of preparedness by a lot of our physicians are beginning at the pediatrician level you know, all the way up to when you're an adult, uh, the lack of interventions, um, the lack of support services, uh, and, um, and, you know, and, and the lack of understanding the reality that many people go, to, go through, that when you prescribe painkillers, you know, and all of a sudden it stops, you know, the, the, the craving doesn't stop. 
Uh, and um, but I, I I agree with you. I mean, we th this is a this is a huge a huge problem, and um, and you know we there's increased border patrol. So what comes over the border by way of Mexico, are there, there are more people there, but some of this stuff is coming in by way of Canada. Some of this stuff is coming in in other ways to our shores. Uh, and so, uh, but it's a huge problem. And again, I, uh, uh, you know, my, my prayers are with you and your family with regard to your daughter. Yeah. It's not the same thing, but uh, my sister and I were talking about how these pop places are popping up everywhere. And they have big billboards, you know, glorifying them, and where you can't do it with cigarettes or alcohol, but yet you see a sign everywhere about drugs. And it's like, it's really annoying, you know? I mean, they had one, they took it down, it said, open your mind to whatever, you know, the drug, right? You know, something about opening the mind. And I just feel like, opening the mind. These people that do this, some of them are driving down the road, and they're driving on the wrong side of the road, and they kill someone. Yeah. You know? It, it, I don't understand why they're allowed to have some of those signs anywhere. You know? When they can't do it for other stuff. Right, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, you, know, the, uh, you know, the whole, the, the cannabis, I mean, cannabis is legal now. Um, although, as, with everything else, the federal laws haven't caught up with the state laws. I don't think they should anyway. Yeah. But, but, but the deal is, you know, for some, um, you know, there are medicinal benefits to it. Um, I mean, I, I have veterans that come, I, I have a lot of veterans that come to my office, you know, who complain that, um, you know, uh, that at the VA, you can't be prescribed um, cannabis for anything. Maybe be, in that be, yeah, because, it's a, because the federal government hasn't recognized the legality in the VA is a federal institution, but if you were, you know, somebody, you know, who went into a, a, a private doctor's office, you could um, get some guidance on on how to uh, how to be able to utilize it to help either with uh, cancer patients have uh, have said they've gotten benefits from it. People with uh, post traumatic stress have said they've gotten benefits from it. Like with every everything, I mean, like alcohol, I mean, you know, you you. you you have to be concerned about if it is abused. Um, and I think uh, the state and the federal government are still trying to figure out like where, you know, how, how, do, we, how, do, we, how do we manage all this? How do we handle all of this? Um, but it's, um, uh, but I, I hear what you're saying and I've, I've you know, I've, I've, heard of, I've heard the concerns that you have raised from a lot of people. I've also heard about the benefits uh, that people have, have received from this, um, from, uh, from a lot of people as well. So it's, uh, um, but, um, but it, you know, but just because it's legal doesn't mean that there aren't legitimate concerns. Um, and just because there are some le le legitimate concerns, I think we should also understand that, you know, for, for some there, there are benefits to this. And so um, we have to find that, that, that balancing point. Yeah. It's not related to this. I'm going to go off topic unless somebody else has something to say about this. I'm really concerned about the housing. Uh, right now, it's over a five year wait for housing right now. For, um, like for any of our seniors to get into senior housing or get an apartment, it's, it's very difficult. I just wondered what your office was looking into. And so, I mean, uh, well, we're, we're trying to, on the federal level, provide more, more assistance to the states and communities in terms of being able to build more affordable housing. I mean, I... More subsidies. Yeah, well, well and, and, there, and the appropriations bills that we passed last year, there are more subsidies for, you know... But like I said, currently right now, right. they're on Section 8. Right, Section 8. There's the, yeah, there's, right, there's right. And, and it's also because of, of the availability of where who will take Section 8, uh, you know, uh, applications and who will, you know, who will, you know, and finding apartments or housing that, that, that you know, will, will utilize Section 8. Uh, but here, here's the deal. I mean, we have a housing shortage in the urban areas, in the suburban areas, and in the rural areas. 
Um, and people who live in Deerfield, you know, don't want to find, don't want to move to Springfield, you know, um, or, you know, or vice versa, right? So the answer is that we have to build more and we have to under, and we have to take exist, you know, existing, you know, even, even looking at old schools that we no longer utilize or, or vacant buildings and, and figure out how we can, you know, transform them into, into affordable housing. In the original Build Back Better bill, there was a whole section uh, uh, dedicated toward uh, investing dramatically more in affordable housing. This bill that we're gonna come up with is gonna be a little bit pared down uh, because we don't have the votes to, to pass it otherwise. Uh, but, um, but I would also say the money that we sent in the American Rescue Act you know, to the states, I mean, they're, they're still deciding how to spend this money. They've spent some of it already, uh, but the state still has got about close to $3 billion that it hasn't decided how they it wants to distribute. And it has to make some choices. And my hope is that here in Massachusetts anyway, uh, the state, the state legislators, the governor, um, but my, 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 my hope would be that uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how they're going to, I mean, I don't, I'm not in the state legislature. I don't know the proportion of what they have not spent or what they've already spent is going to go toward affordable housing, but, it, but, it, but a significant amount needs to. And I would like those funds to be used for things like that, that have long-term benefits other than kind of a one-time, well, let me give you a break, you know, uh, you know, a $200 check or a $300 check. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to see it invested in things that are going to be long term. Has increased substantially right. in the last two years. Yeah. Most people for a thousand dollar apartment now is paying up to seventeen hundred dollars right. to two thousand for the exact same. Thing. Yeah, which is which is which is and most people can't afford it. Right, but you know, as we work on trying to find additional funding for affordable housing, if we could lower prescription drugs, if we could lower the cost of fuel. If we can lower your gas costs, that helps offset it. Doesn't necessarily solve the problem the way we want it to be solved, but at least in the short term, we can get some relief. But in the long term, I mean, there, there is more federal money in the last bill that we passed and in the one that we, the appropriations bills that we passed and the one we are doing now to invest in affordable housing than ever before. In addition, there is American Rescue Act money that the state now has in hand. Um, that they can decide how they want to, how they want to spend it. And I, and I trust that some of it will, will go toward affordable housing. But the problem is enormous. Um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and again, I mean, we, we, you need to be able to afford where you live. You need to be able to afford to put food on the table. You need to be, be able to afford your prescription drugs. You need to be able to afford gas in your car to get to places. Uh, you know, so all these things are you know, are, are interconnected, but, um, but there's some help on the way. There's some help on the way in some of these things. Yes. So you mentioned um, the Affordable Care, or the Affordable, um, the American Rescue Act. Right. And are there any plans to invest in infrastructure further coming from the House? Because um, as Sue, our program coordinator mentioned, you know, the biggest concern is not only then the cost of housing, but food. We've, we offer a pop-up food bank in partnership with the Franklin County um, Survival Center every month. And that's our top day that we get the most attendance, um, as well as the brown bag program through directly through the Food Bank of Western Mass, which I know you do a, right. a, a huge amount to support right. them. But um, overall, if you're looking at infrastructure bills, if that money would go to the to the local community, hopefully, you know, sooner than waiting two years from each state to provide uh, the resources that they currently have been sitting on to make those decisions. Right. But having that infrastructure uh, bill going forward, it would reduce the cost of real estate taxes and the other local taxes each community is having to raise, unfortunately, because they're paying for like in Deerfield, I know it's the sewers, a bigger cost. Other places it's renovating elementary schools and high schools. Um, and the amount of attendance, you know, for, for younger folks attending school, the investment's going up. But unfortunately, it seems the seniors aren't getting an additional investment to them. 
Um, and for everyone here, the majority live on a fixed income um, because they're on retirement or social security. And some folks don't have the highest amount of that, but it seems to me if they were to start an infrastructure process, you know, to, to support the entire country's infrastructure, um, it would reduce the overall arching right. costs going up on a regular basis right. each year. So in addition to what I just mentioned, we also passed an infrastructure bill uh, that is the biggest investment in infrastructure in the history of our country. Uh, to do everything from roads, bridges, water, sewer, um, ex expanding broadband, all that kind of stuff, that if we didn't pass it, then the lion's share of the cost would fall on the local communities to be able to do that. I mean, when your water and your sewer systems are falling apart, you have to fix them. And um, the trouble is they're enormously expensive. And so the only way that, you know, without help from the federal or state government, that some, a town like Deerfield can do these things is by raising property taxes, mm -hmm. which takes away from, which makes it harder to live here. Uh, but it also takes away from funds for, you know, you know improving senior centers or schools or, you know, recreational activities. And so there's these kind of terrible choices have to be made. But as we had a discussion with some of the town officials, I mean, Massachusetts, from, in addition to its normal allocation of infrastructure monies that gets from the federal government, gets an additional $12 billion uh, in infrastructure monies that quite frankly should be able to fix a lot of the challenges that a lot of the smaller towns have. Um, now that, 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 I mean, I, and, I, and I think that, you know, um, you know, that should alleviate some of the pressure on, on some of the smaller towns, even on in some of the bigger cities uh, as well. I mean, I did a Google search of like a, a, a bridge, bridges that are in my district that are structurally deficient, you know, that are classified as, you know, as in need of repair, like now. And I, was, I joke, I'm lucky I'm alive uh, because there are so many, but they have to be fixed. I mean, water and sewer, um, you know, issues have to be fixed. I just, we just helped the town of Douglas, which is on the other side of my district, you know, get a $3 million grant to upgrade its uh, water and sewer capacity, which they couldn't do otherwise. Um, and the reason why it's important for them is because they can't expand their tax base either with additional housing or with, you know, maybe a factory that might want to locate there or another big business. They can't do that because they don't have the water and sewer capacity. Uh, but yet they, they can't raise the money off of increasing property taxes. So, you know, this federal grant that they received help, helps them be able to do that. They will get these, uh, these two new um, structures that will be basically a place to store, um, you know, all kinds of goods that various businesses around the country want. Also deals with a supply chain issue, um, but it will expand their tax base. So in return, they'll have more money to invest in their seniors and their schools and their parks, you know, and all the things that they need. And so, you know, you know that we all, I mean, I think to your point is that we all have to, I mean, we all have to understand that everything is kind of interrelated. So when we talk about investing in, a, in upgrading sewer facilities, it doesn't sound like the most sexy topic in the world to talk about, but it directly impacts the ability to improve services for senior citizens or for our students. Because if there's, if, if, if we, if, if, if there's not a federal partnership in some of these things, they either don't get done, you know, or the town ends up, that, that's all you can do. Um, and uh, so, the, I mean, I, I think the challenge, at least here in Massachusetts, in the short term is, there is a lot of federal money that has gone to the state. The state has more money than any time that I can recall. And, you know, whether it's the American Rescue Act money, whether it's the infrastructure money. Um, so the issue is, how is that money gonna be spent? And we have to make, and this is why I was, I was praising your, you know, your, your town officials here for actually having a plan. 
Um, because I can tell you right now that the big cities in Massachusetts have a thousand grant writers and they are already, you know, lobbying, you know, the state legislature for every single cent in federal money that has been sent to the state. You know, we need to be, you know, as aggressive, you know, as those big cities to make sure that these small towns don't get overlooked because in many respects, this is where the greatest need is. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful, I mean, you have, I, I work very closely with the state delegation here, with the local officials. I mean, I think, I think we are, you know, we are in a situation that we can actually take advantage of a lot of the federal funds that have gone uh, into the state uh, and that could benefit uh, towns like Deerfield. I think you're gonna, you know. But it would be up to the town itself to, write, to apply for the grant. Yeah. It wouldn't be somebody like in a district applying for like Franklin County or something. Well, it could be both. It could be. It could be. It could be both. Some things are, are regional, right? Uh, you could do it as a, a regional. Some things are, you know, are, are town related. I mean, it, it, there's there's no kind of, you know, no end to it. I, I guess the, the the deal is, and I say this all everybody all the time, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? And um, you know, and and if you don't have a plan, then when you ask, it's like, okay, you're asking me to invest in what? And we, you know how you know, and what are the benefits of what we're doing here? So there's a plan here. There's a good regional, you know, um, uh, uh, re there are good regional organizations here as well that are working with a bunch of towns um, to help with some of the grant writing and to help identify opportunities. Um, but look, you know, in the past, the issue has always been there's no money. There's no money. I got to be honest with you, that, that's not so much the case right now. I mean, the state has a lot of money uh, and a lot of federal investment. Um, and by the way, the American Rescue Act, in addition to providing money to the state, actually provided money to, to cities and towns as well uh, and to our local school systems that had to deal with kind of an extraordinary range of challenges during COVID. Um, and that was costly. And so some of that federal money came to offset that. If it didn't, you, you know, budgets here would have been even that much tighter. So some, there, there, there's, I mean, there's, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying, I mean, I get the feeling that things are beginning to come together in terms of our ability to move in the direction that we all want us to move in. Yeah. Well, we've moved to what about cinema? Uh, what about cinema? Well, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know what, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to, how do, how do I put this? Uh, you know, look, I know Senator Sinema, she was, I served with her in the House before she ran for, se for Senate. You know, you know th th this is like, this is like a Ouija board where like we, we should be wondering where the answer is, right? I mean, politicians ought to tell you where they stand. If she's got a problem with this bill that would lower the cost of prescription drugs for seniors and others, that would fight inflation by putting money toward reducing the deficit, that would invest record amounts in combating the climate crisis, you know, if she's got a problem with that, tell us what it is and let's see if we can fix it. But the Senate has to decide this next week, this week. And I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what, why this is such a, uh, you know, a mystery. I mean, you're, e I mean, you're either for it or against it. If you're against it, you know, what do we need to do to fix? Just help us, but don't blow this opportunity. I mean, we have been trying to get Medicare the ability to negotiate on bulk on behalf of all senior citizens, lower prescription drugs forever. The pharmaceutical companies have fought us, have fought us, have invested zillions of dollars in misleading ads on TV so that we wouldn't move forward. We are there. We can do this. And everybody benefits. I don't talk to too many people who say, oh, raise my prescription drug cost. That's a good idea, right? No, nobody thinks that, right? So we, we can do this. So I, 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 I'm hoping that, you know, you know, she's there, but 
I don't know, just wants a headline? I don't know, who knows, right? But uh, yeah, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the, the ratio in the Senate is so tight, you know, one person decides not to be there. Um, you know, that's the ball game. And, uh, and then we've had senators in the last week who have had COVID, um, and so they've been absent. And then we had one senator who broke his hip, and so he's un unable to show up. And then we've, and then for whatever reason, if you're a senator and it's cloudy out, you can't fly into Washington. I don't understand what that's about. But the bottom line is, we just need them to vote, right? You know, and I'm hoping that they, this, this would be a huge victory for the country. And everybody here would see the benefits from it. Uh, and the planet would see the benefits from, the, from it. And if you're worried about inflation, let's, let's, start, let's start getting serious about paying down the, uh, the, uh, the, de the, debt, uh, the deficit and the debt. That will help uh, with inflation. I mean, it's, it's like a win, 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 win for everybody. So like, let's just do it. So, um, so I'm hoping that she's okay. Um, if not, um, you know, if not, then I will tell you what I really think at another gathering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for the congressman today? Hi, Chief. I was just, we were just talking about, the first question was about the, uh, desi the designation of the Deerfield River as wild and scenic, and everybody commented how we were on the bridge. What I didn't tell them was that we didn't get run over because the chief was there making sure that cars went around us. So I, we appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me just end with the way I, I, I began. Look, everybody has, uh, I, I just say a couple of things. Just, I just want people to think about in addition to all the stuff that we're talking about right now, I mean, we have, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat, or Republican, liberal, conservative, moderate, whatever. I mean, we all, this is the beauty of this country is we can believe whatever we want to believe, right? I will tell you as the last person on the House floor on January 6th, I took over from the Speaker of the House who came face to face with this crowd that attacked the Capitol. We all have to be concerned about protecting the integrity of our democracy. Um, we came very close to losing it. And, I, and, I, and, and when people kind of downplay it, I, I, I gotta push back because this is not the way we wanna go. Um, we, we, we have to, truth is the truth and facts are facts. Um, you know, and you know, you know this, is a, this is a cup it's not a table, you know, and I can say it's a table, but it's still a cup, right? I mean, we, 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 we are at a point where there are things being said that defy reality. And, um, you know, and, you know, and we should expect more of people uh, in terms of respecting our democracy. You lose that, you lose any voice that you may have in government, you, you just do. Um, and democracy is messy. And sometimes it takes time. And sometimes you get people who you don't like who are representing you, and you gotta wait till the next election to get rid of them. But the bottom line is that is a system that I would prefer over any authoritarian system in the world. I um, mean, because it's, it's, it's about people, number one. And so I, I hope people will you know, take all of what we are learning, especially from the January 6th co committee, very, very seriously. Secondly, you know, we, we have to get back to putting people above politics. I mean, it, it just, you know, I mean, this whole thing with the burn pits stuff, that's, that's politics, you know, when people ought to be focused on helping these veterans. I mean, like, 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 like what, what planet are these people living on when they think somehow by withholding this bill that they're who they're punishing veterans is somehow they're making a political point. That has to stop. You know, people ask me, I was at an event last night, you know, why can't you pass universal background checks on guns? 85% of the American people want it. You know what? It's because it's about, that's the case where politics is being put ahead of people. You know, follow the money, right? And find out, you know, who's contributing to who. And you'll realize why on something that, you know, 85% of the American people favor, 
you know, you get politicians who are siding with the gun lobby over, in the, over people. And no one's talking about taking away Second Amendment rights. But we, we, we're saying kids have a right to go to school and not get shot. And unfortunately, in this country right now, uh, that's not a guarantee. You know, the issue on prescription drugs. I mean, again, you know, we should all want to, you know, yeah, you, you, we, drug companies have to make money. We understand that. But they don't have to gouge you, you know? I mean, we, we, are, we can pass a bill that, that will lower the cost of prescription drugs for every single person in this room. Why don't we just do it? Like who's, again, but you look at where the politics and the money is, you know, it's, it's, it's against doing that. You know, gas prices. Again, I mean, I, 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 we, we, have, we have reporters that have listened in on shareholders' meetings with the big oil companies. They all brag about how they're ripping people off, making record profits. <laughs> it, it, never in the history of their existence have they made more, right? And yet they're charging you more. And they're not even going up to the, they're, they're not even producing what they can easily produce within their existing capacity. And he just, it's wrong, right? We've got to fix this. And, and you know, and, and, then, and, then, on the issue, and then on the issue of, of the climate crisis, you know, young students here in Deerfield and all across my district come to my office. They, they hold signs and placards about Save Our Planet, and they're, you know, sending me petitions and letters because they want to have, they want to, they, they want to have, they want to protect this planet, you know, not only as they get older, but for future generations. They get it. If we listen to them, and if we could pass this bill that we're talking about passing, we can have historic amounts of investment in, com in combating the climate crisis, create all these new jobs, save the planet, and on top of all of that, we can begin a more aggressive transition away from fossil fuels to green, clean, renewable energy. So never, ever, ever again do we have to you know, worry about you know, these, these spikes in, in oil prices and gas prices. This is nuts. This is not the first time it's happened, by the way. I'm old enough to remember in the 1970s when you, when we, 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 when you, you couldn't get gas uh, on certain days. You, you could only get gas if you're, the last number of your license plate was odd. You go on one day, if it was even another day. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we all thought then that that was a wake-up call to, to, do, to think differently. We didn't, because the next day when, when everything went down, we all went about our life. And now you see what's happening um, with gas prices. We're at the mercy of, of, of these terrible dictators like the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And then you get Putin, who's a madman, um, committing a, a, you know, the, the terrible war crimes against Ukrainians. So, you know, I mean, you know, politics are about people. That's the way we, we ought to approach at the local level at the state level, at the federal level. I mean, just, uh, pe sorry, people ahead of politics. People ahead of politics. And I think if we all keep that in mind, you know, what is, what is in the best interest of the people? Not necessarily what's in the best interest of my political well-being, but what's in the best interest of the people. If we keep on focusing on that, I think we'll make a lot of progress. Um, and, um, and so I appreciate you being here today. I appreciate the, the opportunity to come here and, um, you know, I have an office in Northampton. Kobe in the back is, so if, you get a, if, if there are individual issues, just call us. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to coming back again soon. So thank you all for having me here. Thank you. <laughs>